Hey everybody, this is Zachary Jeans. Let's keep walking through the Bible. So today is day 381 and we are in the book of Numbers. We are in the Pentateuch, the first five books, five fingers. Um, it is the beginning of the Old Testament, really the Bible itself, obviously. And uh, we are in Numbers, so we're in the fourth. And uh, we'll be finishing up here in a couple weeks in Deuteronomy. I love Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a re, a retelling basically of uh, Exodus and 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 really the whole first five books. You know its references and whatnot. So can't wait. Deuteronomy might be third or fourth favorite book in the whole Bible. So, uh, but we are in Numbers and we are in Numbers chapter fifteen through seventeen. So if you want to stop. And just after we pray here, hit pause and go ahead and, and open up your Bible and just kind of read through carefully or, or skim. doesn't matter. But, you know, get familiar with the text. Um, that way, when we go through the text, if we skip parts or whatever for the teaching opportunity that we have today, um, you, you don't miss the text itself. So, all right. Why don't we stop? Why don't we pray? But let me get a sip of coffee first. Mm. Man, that's good. I love this mug, this truth mug. It's so great. It's uh, John 8, 32. All right. <clears throat> Why don't we stop? Let's pray. Lord, I love you. God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for being merciful towards me and patient towards me. God, thank you for being merciful and patient towards me, my family, those around me. God, please have mercy. God, help us be faithful with what you've given us. God, thank you for what you have given us. And God, thank you for your word today. God, please open it up. Please help me be faithful to it and faithful to you, faithful to these people that are getting in your word. And Lord, we just lay this at your feet, Jesus. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> By God's grace, may we be faithful to, to what he's given us today. You know. All right. Well. Chapter 15 of Numbers. Let's go ahead and open it up. ESV.org. And uh, that's what I'm reading out of. Now, for the first chapter here that we're going to look at today, chapter 15, we aren't going to get super deep. But let's just go ahead and open it up. Uh, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land you are to inhabit, which I am given you, and you offer to the Lord from the herd or from the flock a food offering or a burnt offering or a sacrifice to fulfill a vow or as a freewill offering or at your appointed feast to make a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Then he who brings his offering shall offer to the Lord a grain offering of a tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with a quarter of hen oil. You shall offer the burnt offering or the sacrifice a quarter of a hen of wine for the drink offering for each lamb. So if you're going to offer an offering, it's also got to be accompanied by this other offering. Why? This is the Lord. He has his reasons. You shall offer a grain offering, two tenths of an ephah, fine flour mixed with a third of hen of oil. For the drink offering, you shall offer a third of a hen of wine, pleasing aroma to the Lord. And when you offer a bowl as a burnt offering, or sacrifice to fill a vow, or peace offerings to the Lord, then one shall offer with the bowl a grain offering of three tenths an ephah of fine flour mixed with half a hen of oil. And you shall offer for the drink offering half a hen of wine as a food offering, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So you are going to offer uh, for various different feasts and vows and you know, ordinances that the Lord has set up, right, and been very specific um, when you go to offer an animal, um, you're also to offer with it um, basically some cakes, some bread, right? That's the flour and the oil and water and all that. And also a drink offering of sorts um, with the wine. So when you do this, it should be done with each bull, each ram, each lamb or young goat, as many as you offer, you shall do with each one as there are 
Every native Israelite shall do these things in this way, is an offering, a food offering with pleasing aroma to the Lord. If a stranger is a sojourner with you or among you, is living permanently among you, and he wishes to offer a food offering, you got travelers that are in town and they want to offer, well, he shall do as you do. For the assembly, there shall be one statute for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you, a statute forever throughout your generations. You and the sojourner shall be alike before the Lord. One law, one rule shall be for you and for the stranger who sojourns, sojourn with you. Sojourn, you know, basically visiting and sticking around, right? So we don't have separate laws for those that are hanging out and wanting to offer with you. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I bring you, and when you eat of the bread of the land, you shall present a contribution to the Lord. On the first of your dough, you shall present a loaf as a contribution. Like a contribution from the threshing floor, so you shall present it. A threshing floor is where harvesting in, you know, grain, wheat, all that. Some of the first of your dosh you shall give to the Lord as contribution throughout your generations. What's the principle here? When you make an offering, you're also to offer some bread and some wine, a drink offering. Uh, what do we what do we have when we do communion? What did God use through Jesus there on the Last Supper, the Passover? We just celebrated. Well, I didn't celebrate, but the the world acknowledged that the Jewish people just celebrated their Passover. Okay, just the other day, actually. And uh, and to that end, when Jesus celebrated Passover in the upper room with his disciples, he took bread on the night and he broke it and he passed some bread on. Right. And this is at the end of the meal. Basically, they've been breaking bread all night, but he stopped and took a moment and he and he broke some bread. and He said, this is my body. It's broken for you. And then he grabbed the fourth cup or many cups, but probably the fourth cup because there was a ceremony to all this. And this fourth cup of wine that they had over the course of very long, uh, hanging out, reminiscing, talking with each other, reflecting on, on the Lord, uh, not Jesus, <clears throat> but reflecting on, on God, Yahweh, um, in the upper room. And they're talking about the things of, of Israel and the things of life and God. And he takes this this fourth cup, this last cup of wine in the Passover service or, or meal. And he says, hey, this cup, this wine, drink it. It's like my blood. It's going to be poured out for you. And what's he saying? He's like, I'm going to be your Passover sacrifice. I, I am going to be your lamb. And <clears throat> here we have all the way back in the day when you offer an animal... You also offer bread and wine. It's right there. The image. All right. So verse 22. But if you sin unintentionally and do not observe all these commandments that the Lord has spoken to Moses, all that the Lord has commanded you by Moses from the day that the Lord gave commandment and onward throughout your generations, then if it was done unintentionally without the knowledge of the congregation, all the congregation shall offer one bowl from the herd or for a burnt offering. It's a pleasing aroma to the Lord with its grain offering and its drink offering, right? Bread and wine. According to the rule, one male goat for a sin offering and the priest shall make atonement for all the congregation of the people of Israel. And they shall be forgiven because it was a mistake and they have brought their offering and food offering to the Lord or their sin offering before the Lord for their mistake. And all the congregation of the people of Israel shall be forgiven. And the stranger who sojourns, that means against, sojourn. There's all these words, right? We don't use them in our modern language, sojourns. I wish they would have translated this differently. But, you know, it's like visiting, hanging out. Among them, right, if they're hanging out with you, because of the whole population was involved in the mistake. So... The guilt, if there's some sort of sin, an un unintentional sin, then even that sin can be atoned for through this process. 
If one person sins unintentionally, he shall offer a female goat year old for a sin offering, if the priest, and the priest shall make atonement before the Lord. The person who makes a mistake when his, he sins unintentionally to make atonement for him shall be forgiven. You shall have one law for him who does anything unintentionally, for him who is a native among the people of Israel, and for the stranger who, stranger who sojourns among them. But the person who does anything with a high hand, okay, note this, so this is an unintentional, but somebody who does something with a high hand, whether he is native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from among the people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be on him. That's somebody who knows better and does it anyway. Double flipping the finger to the Lord, right? Double birds. F you, Lord. I know better and I'm doing it. That person cut off, right? Now, mind you, the modern church wrestles with this, okay? Because the whole concept of excommunicado, excommunique, like kicking them out, right? So um, this applies to uh, teachers and pastors who, you know, sin against the Lord in a outward, like just straight up denying Jesus sort of way. I mean, uh, the church really wrestles with this because they want to take this, you know, seemingly godly man or woman who served in the church for all these years, who decides that they're going to get jiggy with it and sleep around, right? And just totally flip the Lord off with their actions, like boldly, and uh, or steal from the church. I think that one over gets overlooked too, right? Skims from the offerings into an account and has a place in the Caymans or whatever, you know, things like that. Or it could be something more nascent, you know, low key, but straight up still a rebellion against the Lord. And so then the, the church as a whole struggles with that because denominations lack, you know, experienced pastors and teachers and whatever. And believe it or not, they shuffle them off into a new congregation in some other place after they repent. But they don't tell the new congregation that they uh, committed adultery at the previous place, right? Things like that. So uh, that sucks. And uh, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. Look, if you've rebelled against the Lord in a major way and you've been in a position of authority or leadership um, and you want to keep teaching the Bible and congregating with the folks and uh, not being kicked out, um, you have every right and opportunity to repent with the Lord. He has every right and authority to kick your ass for a while. Um, and I think that's gracious of him that he doesn't strike his dead. Because he has every right to. Because his name is to be honored, right? Um, but that said... You can find fellowship again, but here's the deal: you don't get a you don't get to run a church anymore. You don't get a leader youth group. You don't get a uh, you know run a run a camp you know a Christian camp. You don't get to do that anymore. You got to jump back in the workforce like the rest of us. Okay, there's no shame in that. Honest labor, doing a good job, working in a company doing something, you need to teach the Bible a little bit on the side, you can participate in a Bible study, right? Teach your family, you can repent, um, but you don't, you don't get to go run a church, okay? Let's talk about the Sabbath breaker. So all this is going to be actually explained here in numbers, like how they employed these strict laws about, you know, people who are just straight up rejecting God, not unintentionally, but with a high hand, right? So verse 32, while the people of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathered st gathering sticks brought him to Moses. 
and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him in custody because he had not, it had not been made clear what should be done to him. So he's out there working on, on the Sabbath. This isn't rescuing a, a cow or a goat out of a pit or, you know, um, uh, making dinner on the Sabbath or something like that, right? Which Jesus was like, dude, the Sabbath was made for man. Like this, this was a gift to you, right? Um, it's so that you will rest and honor the Lord. Um, but here he is clearly just going the hell with this. This whole like, oh, now we can't work on this day and, and God Almighty will be mad at us and all this. And he's just out there doing it, right? Again, this doesn't apply to you as a, as a New Testament Christian, but there's a principle here, right? It means you're using your life and your attitudes and your actions to mock God, to tell him that he doesn't matter and what he says doesn't matter. So, verse 35, And the Lord said to Moses, The man shall be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. And all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death with stones And the Lord command, as the Lord had commanded Moses. They threw rocks at him until he died. That is a horrible way to die. And then, of course, we have this little passage about the tassels on the garments. Verse 37, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of the garments throughout their generations. Put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. It shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them. Not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. Prostitute yourself after. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. He is not mocking, messing around with them, mocking them, him with their lives. And even though we live in an era and a time where Jesus has poured out an abundance of mercy through his blood and sacrifice on the cross and then his Holy Spirit into our lives, our physical lives. He's put his spiritual life into us. And we don't live like the people of Israel in the desert wilderness and the, and the Holy Land, uh, keeping uh, blood sacrifices and all this. Um, guess what? God, God still cares. Nothing's changed there. And God is still holy. And he's meant to be honored. And having some tassels and things and, you know, for us, we don't have tassels and things like that up around the house. I mean, when you graduate high school or college, you get, you know, your tassel for your cap there. Um, and it's a reminder of what you did, right? All the stuff you learned. Um, but we more in modern evangelical Christianity, um, what do we do? Well, <laughs> we put up little memes and and, and uh, Bible verses on our Facebook page, right? To remind us and to remind others of the words of the Lord. We put up stuff in our bathroom about honoring God, you know? And uh, we do these, these things. And, and this is kind of our modern version of, of putting up reminders to honor God and his words. All right, so chapter 16, Korah's Rebellion. Man, what a sight to behold. So verse 1 of chapter 16, Korah, son of Kohath, son of Levi, or Izar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, the sons of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. They rose up before Moses. So these are no obscure tribes or families. Okay, these are, these are legitimate people who serve in ministry and are heads, you know, Reuben, the firstborn son. So in that line and all this, they took 250 chiefs of the congregation chosen from the assembly, well-known men. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to him, you've gone too far for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them. The Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves before the 
above the assembly of the Lord. So, this is a, <laughs> they want a flat company structure here. Everybody's equal in terms of responsibility, authority, ministry, service. Um, God's in all of us. What are you doing there, Moses, Aaron? You know, why, why do you get to call the shots? So, verse 4, when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And he said to Korah and all his company, In the morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to him. The one who he chooses, he will bring near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah, and all his company. Put fire in them. Put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow. The man whom the Lord chooses shall be holy, the Holy One. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it too small a thing for you that God of Israel has separated you from among the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord and stand before the congregation and minister to him? And that he has brought you near to him and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. And would you seek the priesthood also? So they were the ones who were, you know, serving God, the Levites, at least the portion of these elders here, uh, that were serving in the capacity of carrying all the important things for the Lord and, you know, um, helping get things set up for the sons of Aaron, the priesthood, who actually did the sacrificing. So, um, so let's just move down here um, to verse... Uh, 16. Okay. So Moses said to Korah, be present, you and all your company before the Lord, you and they and Aaron tomorrow, and let every one of you take his censer. And it's kind of like a metal, you know, bowl type thing. So you can put the incense in there and light the fire and it smokes. <clears throat> then Korah assembled all the congregation against them, verse 19, at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. He was going to burn them up. Uh, and they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh shall one man sin, and will you be angry with all the congregation? The Lord set, spoke to Moses, saying, Say to the congregation, Get away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So they intercede on behalf of all of Israel and, and essentially just say, God, you know, would you would you wipe everyone out on behalf of just these? men who they're the ones that are guilty and God said then separate yourselves from them then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Barim and the elders of Israel followed him and he spoke to the congregation saying depart please from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs lest you be swept away with all their sins so they got away from the dwelling of Korath Dathan and Abiram and Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents together with their wives, their sons, their little ones. Whole families come on out of their tents, standing at the front of their tents. Everybody's backing off. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. It's not my own doing, right? If these men die as all men die, or if they are visited by the fate of mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. If they get old, they die, they fall, they break their ankle, normal things that happen to people as they age, and that's how they go, the Lord's not with me on this. But, but, if these men die... Uh, if the Lord creates something new and the ground opens it mouth, its mouth and swallows them up, with all that belongs to him, and they go down alive to Sheol, then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. And as soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground under him split apart. 
And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. With their households, all the people belonged to Korah and all their goods, so that all belonged to them went down alive to Sheol. And the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. They were swallowed alive by the earth, these, these leaders of the uh, families. And there's a lot of great movies that uh, show something like that, right? Um, earthquake movies, particularly, are scary because they just show, you know, the earth opens up and you get pulled down and then... You know, as things settle in, the earth falls on top of you and you're done. There are sinkholes that happen. Pretty scary. We had one here in, in Vancouver. Just opened right up on a corner of a street and a car went around and fell in. Now, thankfully, the person lived. But stuff like that happens, right? Here's an opportunity for God to demonstrate his seriousness about who he's put in charge, his order of worship, those who will do the worship, those who will carry the stuff, you know, all of this, God makes it abundantly clear through something new, and he does it. He burns up the other 250 men, right? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, to take up censers out of the blaze, then scatter the fire far and wide, for they have become holy. So these men who took their censers to offer their incense and God decided that they were in rebellion and he kills them with his holy fire. But this is the thing that actually sanctifies the actual censers and makes them holy. As for the censers of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives, let them be made into hammered plates as covering for the altar. For they have offered them before the Lord and they became holy. Thus they shall be a sign to the people of Israel. So Eliezer the priest took the bronze censers, which those who were burned and offered, and they were hammered out as covering for the altar, for a reminder to the people of Israel, so that no outsider who is not of the descendants of Aaron should draw near to burn incense before the Lord, lest he become like Korah and his company, as the Lord said to him through Moses. It's pretty amazing, right? So they hammer it out, they cover everything. So when the altar is moved, um, you know, from site to site and, and down the line, uh, when they see that, they know that God appoints those that are meant to do the offerings. And those who aren't, can't do them. But on the next day, all the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Wow. And when the congregation had assembled against Moses and against Aaron, they turned toward the tent of meeting, and behold, the cloud covered it. The glory of the Lord appeared, and Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from the midst of the congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. They rebel again, right? And God's like, I'm going to wipe them out. That's it. I'm done. Again, I'm done. And Moses said to Aaron, <clears throat> so they fall on their faces, right? And then Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put fire on it from off the altar and lay incense on it and carry it quickly to the congregation, make atonement for him. For wrath has gone out from the Lord and the plague has begun. So Aaron took it, as Moses said, and ran into the midst of the assembly. And behold, the plague had already begun among the people. He put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. The plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700. Besides those who died in the affair of Korah. You know, swallowed up and burnt by the holy fire. And Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent meeting when the plague was stopped. And so many times that's what's happening. This world's dying. And, and if you have the gospel, it's like we have the thing which stands between the living and the dead. And uh, most mostly people don't 
want to even talk about God, let alone the gospel. And uh, yeah, that's pretty rough. It's pretty rough. All right, chapter 17. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel. Get from them staffs, one for each father's house, from all the chiefs according to their father's houses. Twelve staffs. So each tribe, get a staff. Write each man's name on his staff, and write Aaron's name on the staff of Levi. For there shall be one staff for the head of each father's house. Then you shall deposit them in the tent of meeting before the testimony where I'll meet with you. And the staff of the man whom I choose shall sprout. Thus I will make to cease from me the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against you. Okay, we're going to settle this. Everybody get a stick. <laughs> Write your name on it. Put it in the tent of meeting. We'll make, we will show, God says, well, I'm going to show who I'm standing with in this matter. Okay. So they deposit them in the tent of the testimony. Verse 8. On the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony. Behold, the staff for Aaron, the house of Levi. Okay, so Aaron's staff, which was on the Levite's staff, had sprouted and put forth buds and produced. So a dead stick became alive. Isn't that crazy? And blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. Then Moses brought out all the staffs from before, uh, from before the Lord to all the people of Israel. And they looked, and each man took a staff. And the Lord said to Moses, Put back the staff of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign for the rebels, that you may make an end of their grumblings against me, lest they die. Thus Thus did Moses, as the Lord commanded him. So he did. And the people of Israel said to Moses, Behold, look, we perish. We're undone. We're all undone. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Are we all to perish? They, they finally got it. <clears throat> at least at this moment of time. You think of all the rebellion, right? All the rebellion. Unwillingness to go up. Uh, when the Lord told him to go up, after he said, hey, don't go up and attack the promised land because I'm not with you. They went up and they got their butts kicked. Standing up against Moses and Aaron. When God was abundantly clear how many times that he was with Aaron and Moses. And specifically and ultimately Moses. Like, and yet we continue to kick against those the structure that the Lord set up and they finally got it but hey don't miss this miracle God took a dead stick and made it alive he made it bud and actually grow almonds or as an uncle once said to me who's an almond far farmer they they don't pronounce it almonds. They pronounce it almonds because they shake the L out of it. <laughs> Love that joke. But anyway, yeah, dead stick came alive. And that's the truth. That's the truth. We're all dead sticks until God makes us alive. And he does put his spirit upon us and in us. And we do have access to our father, this holy, holy, holy God almighty. But he's not to be mocked. And especially if you're in leadership, you're one of a head of a family, you know, or an elder or a deacon or pastor, and you go run in your mouth thinking that you're so so much this and that, or you think you're gonna go, you know, hook up with a little side hustle and you know, screw the church out of something, or you're gonna get a little side piece and Get your sexual fantasies fulfilled, you know, and and guess what? God will find it out. God will find it out, and you're going to feel it. And no, you don't get to serve. And and I won't tell you this. If the, if the denomination lets you serve again, 
you need to bow up there and bow down to the Lord, not to them. And you need to step out in the ministry. Okay? Go get a, go get a job. Go honor and serve the Lord throwing boxes at FedEx or, or uh, you know, go get a job doing something. Learn how to be a, a carpenter or, or something, right? Go earn a living. Go be a congregant. Don't dishonor the Lord, okay? Um, because God, if you do, you're only going to reap worse penalties in the lives of everyone through your life. And guess what also is going to happen? There's going to be a much stricter judgment for you. Now, will you lose salvation? No, but again, you're talking to somebody who believes that that whole settling things up with the Lord at the end isn't all, you know, flying cats and rainbows and and uh, trumpets of joy. I think that there's a, hey man, we're gonna we're gonna get things right here. You might be saved, of course, by faith, by Jesus' sacrifice. But there's something about settling up with the Lord if you've done wrong by him intentionally at the end of things. So don't mock him. Don't don't treat him less than what he is, which is holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. He's not mocked. All right. Hey, till day 382, keep walking, keep walking. The truth will set you free. God bless you. Bye-bye.